Bernie Clark. I'm the creator of the, the website yinyoga.com and also a yin yoga teacher. And I'm joined today with Diana. My name is Diana Batts. I'm a yin yoga teacher as well. And our intention today is to walk you through the use of props in a yin yoga practice. Now props are fairly well known in the yoga world. In the yang world we have quite a few uses of props. In the yin world there's maybe about six or at least six uses of props. Props can be used to help us increase the stress in the pose. Props can be used to help us decrease the stress in the pose. But props can also help us become more comfortable in a pose. It makes the pose a pose that we can actually marinate in longer. Props can also help us to get into poses. There's some poses which, because of the, just the natural shape or proportions of our body, we can't get into. But props can also help us relax, and props can also create space and length to help us achieve different positions in a pose that we wouldn't otherwise get. Now, as you can see around, there's lots of different things we can use in props. There's some kind of standard props you'll find in everyday yoga studios, and there's a few more esoteric props that you may not come across every day, like golf balls and chairs and stairs, or dowels and towels. There's some doweling here, which can be used for the knees. So lots of different things that you can use as props. But we're going to talk mostly about probably the most common six. And that begins with the cushion. You notice both Diane and I are sitting up on cushions. Cushions are great for creating height. And one of the reasons we'd want to have that height is that it can change our orientation to gravity. For instance, if you're very tight in a butterfly, and you have your feet together, and you sit on the floor, it may be very difficult for you to come forward. You're going to have to use your muscles to hold you up here. But by using a cushion, you might be able to come forward enough that gravity starts to draw you down. So a nice thing to do is to, whenever you're doing a seated pose, is to sit up on something, and that's going to help you come into a forward flexion a little bit more easily. Somewhat similar to a block, or a cushion, is a block. Blocks also create height, and the nice thing about blocks is they have three different height settings. There's kind of the low setting, the medium setting, and the high setting. For some people, even sitting up on one cushion is not going to be enough to help them tilt forward. So we can add a block to the cushion, and that may help people sit up high enough that they can start to tilt. The only downside to the block is it's a little bit harder, maybe less comfortable. But for some people, this really allows them to come into a pose. Another way is you can stack them together and sit. See, seja styles, it's called in Japanese. And that may make this Virasana or Vajrasana pose more accessible. Sitting just on the floor or on one cushion may make this too troubling or problematic for your knees. Next in line, we've started with the cushion and the block, are bolsters. Bolsters can also be used to create height, but often bolsters are used to allow you to relax into a pose. So if Diana comes into a butterfly, you might find that bolster along her thighs allows her to come forward to a place where she can just hang out here. She feels supported, she can really release and relax. So we'll be looking at a number of different ways we can use bolsters in our practice. And then you get to other props such as belts. Belts can be used in a number of different ways. Belts can be used to restrain our movements. And we'll show you in a moment a way that Diana uses belts to keep her legs from falling too wide apart in a straddle fold against the wall. Belts can also be used when you fold them up to create space in the body. So it's time to show you in a, a dragon a little lunge. And you can use a belt to prevent that painful compression that some people get at the top of the hip into the thigh. By just tucking the belt folded a few times in there, it makes this pose more accessible and available for us. And of course, belts are often used just to extend our reach people who classically can't grab their hands behind their back, can't quite reach there. If they don't have a long ponytail, they can use a strap to help them hold here. One of the big uses of a strap is to prevent movement, to restrain us. You can see here, Diane is using the strap to prevent her legs from going wider apart, which may be very uncomfortable for some people in the straddle against the wall pose. So here the strap is restraining your feet, which allows you still to feel some stress through the inner adductor muscles, maybe even to the outside of the hip, but allows you to stay in this pose for five or ten minutes. 
In this particular case, Diana is using two straps that have been tied together that gives her the length to allow her feet to go to where her edge is, but not any further than that. We can use straps in a number of ways like this to either lengthen the body, to expand our, our space, or to constrain our space, to restrain the body. So again, straps kind of have three main uses. They restrict our movement, strapping the body together. They can help to increase space, or they can extend our, our reach. Another great prop called sandbags. Sandbags can be used to restrain our movement, to prevent unwanted movement. For instance, uh, in a pose like banana asana, where you're turning sideways, a lot of people, their feet tend to slide out. But if you put a sandbag against the feet, that tends to lock them in place and hold them there. But sandbags can also be used to just make the pose a little bit juicier by helping them add a little bit more weight so people can feel the poses a little bit more intense. The final product that we can also use are blankets. Now, for those familiar with yin yoga, you know that yin is a fairly cool practice. And sometimes it's nice just to have a blanket like a shawl to keep us warm because we don't create any inner heat. But blankets can also be used just to support the body. If you have painful ankles in some poses, having a blanket underneath there can be quite nice. Some poses like frog, where you're demonstrate a frog force. If you're on a hardwood floor, that can be quite painful underneath the knees. But if you put a blanket underneath the knees, you get some support there, and now you can stay in the pose. Also, the blankets can help slide the knees wider apart, so they make the pose a little bit juicier that way as well. Now again, there's all sorts of other props you can use. This particular Astar, I don't know what this one is saying. <laughs> spiky ball. Spiky ball. That's used for uh, massaging your hair. What is this <laughs> you can massage your body and work up and down the length of the muscles either side of the spine and into the juicy muscles of the hips. Can be uh, nice under the feet. The cross balls. A little bit harder than the spiky balls. And then there's the bigger rolling balls and so forth. You can use all sorts of things. There's no real limit. Just remember what your intention is. Like in anything else, you can do too much. The, the intention of using a prop is to help you to get further in your practice. But if you go too far, you'll need to back off. So remember your intention, and of course do everything you do with attention as well. So what we'll do now is we'll walk through some of the basic poses in yin yoga, and we'll demonstrate some of the ways we can use these props to help us either stay in the pose longer, or get a pose that's maybe not available to us, increase sensation or maybe decrease sensation. So if you come into a butterfly, in yin yoga we do something called the long-legged butterfly, where the feet are not being very close, but rather the feet are a little bit further away. For some people, this creates a painful burning sensation in the inner knees. But if you put blocks underneath the thighs, the bones are now supported. And this is a very important principle in yin yoga. If the bones are supported, the muscles can relax. We want the muscles to relax in yin yoga so that the stress in the pose can go into the deeper connective tissues. But if the bones are floating, these muscles are going to engage. So even very experienced yin yoga students tend not to use blocks when maybe they should. If you've never done butterfly without a block before, try it. You might find it allows you to relax here, and that may make it easier for you to come into the pose. And another way to support your knees is to use a bolster. So you can have a bolster across your mat or across your body underneath your knees. Depending on the height, you could raise the bolster with other blocks or blankets on top if you need a higher support under the knees, and then relax the legs and pull it forward. If you're not feeling anything at all, as we showed already, you can use sandbags to just make the pose a bit juicier, just resting them in towards the torso of the body. And now you've got a little bit extra weight helping the knees to come down. You could you combine two, so you could have sandbags on the thighs, but also support the knees. 
so that your legs are heavy and rooting under the weight of the sandbags, but they have the support so they're not going too far down. And if your feet tend to slide out, again, one of the uses of the sandbag is to restrain movement. So by putting a bag on the feet, now the feet aren't sliding out as you come forward into the pose. For some people, when they come forward, they may want a little bit extra juice along the spine. So by just judiciously placing the sandbag along the spine, you get more, more juice here. It's not advisable to let the sandbag drop from a great height, because that would be very yang like So just gently lay it down there. If you want to change the angle that's happening at your hips when you're in your butterfly, you could use blocks between the feet so that will abduct the legs a bit more just to change the sensation perhaps, especially if you've been practicing the in poses for a while. So you can use various bits of block between the feet. For some people, dropping the head is really problematic. They have neck issues or whatever. So, Another thing you can do is you can use a bolster and just rest your head on the bolster. There's a number of different ways to do it. <clears throat> if you want to go a bit lower, again, the nice thing with the blocks, they have the different height settings. You can rest on the high setting, rest your head into your hands here. You find you can use this for a lot of seated forward folds. As you open up, you can just change the height setting here. Okay, so another option in butterfly is to use a chair. So we'll just grab a chair and Anna will show a way of using a chair if as a prop. If you don't have a chair, you could use a stool as well. You could use a table if you have one nearby. So if you have a student who's not able to come very far forward, it's nice to give them support so they can relax in the pose. So a chair, maybe a chair with a blanket on top if they're higher up with a bolster on that as well. So they can lean forward and find support in their practice. You could also use a chair if you're doing a reclining butterfly. It may be too high up for some people, but a nice variation to play with. Lying on your back with your feet on top of the chair. So you get a little bit uh, more height. If a chair is too high, you could use a bolster for your feet as well. So reclining butterflies, nice variation. A student isn't able to go forward if their back isn't feeling safe in a forward fold. We're going to come into is called half butterfly. The full butterfly is both together. The half butterfly is to draw one foot in and stretch the other leg out to the side. You can turn and face that leg. Once again, you start to fold forward. The first key prop to use here again is the cushion. By sitting up on the cushion, it's going to help you come forward enough so that gravity is going to do the work. In yin yoga, we try not to engage the muscles. We're not pulling yourself forward. We're just allowing ourselves to come forward. But if you're very tight in the hamstrings, and I've asked you to come forward, and you're sitting up like this and say, you have, well, by bending the knee, that will release the hamstring, which should allow you to flex the hip enough to let you come forward. Keeping the knee bent, however, could be tiring for a while. So an option is to put something underneath it, a block or a bolster, where now the muscles can relax because the bones are supported. Now you can come forward and just come to an edge. If you don't have a block, you don't have a bolster, you can use several blankets instead so that you're not limited by your props, using them in the same way that you would use a block with a cushion underneath you or the bolster under your knees. If the bent knee doesn't like this, if you have any knee issues, a block or a cushion or a blanket underneath the knee can also be supported as well. If you have sandbags, it can be nice, like in a full butterfly with both legs bent, to support the knee if you need it to, if it's floating, but then to root the top of the thigh with the sandbag. So you could put the sandbag at the top of the thigh of the bent leg. You could also use the sandbag at the top of the thigh of the straight leg, just to root down in the femurs and give a sense of grounding and pose. If you're not able to fold forward very far, you could use your bolster to give you support. If one bolster is too far away, you could add a second one on top of the first so that you're finding the right height so you're supported and can relax. You could also angle the bolster 
using blocks, if you have blocks, block on the far end so that you're able to sink down. If you're not coming far like you did in butterfly, you could use an angled bolster to support your forehead. Like in the butterfly, if you're fairly flexible and you can come down over the straight leg quite a ways, you might find, again, just a little bit extra weight here can help make the pose a bit juicier. Again, sandbags can help make the pose deeper. We progressed from the butterfly, both feet together, to the half butterfly, one leg out straight. Then we'll come into the straddle fold, which has both legs out to the side. Now just like in the half butterfly, for some people, tightness in the hamstrings prevent them from flexing forward. As you start to abduct the legs apart, tightness or shortness in the adductor muscles also tend to pull on our sitting bones, which limits the amount of flexion we can do here. So one option here is again to bend the knees. You can put blocks underneath the thighs or bolsters or blankets, whatever you have is handy. If you have none of those, foam books, big thick novels, they can also be used as blocks. Notice Diana is also still sitting up on a cushion. That's going to also help to tilt her coming forward. If you had a student who was very open, was able to come down to the floor and didn't feel anything in her straddle fold and she needed more intensity and it was safe for her, you could raise her feet on the blocks and then have her sitting up on a block so she's lifted and her torso can come down between the thighs. In effect, we're building a platform here. It would be nice for these very flexible students to dig a pit underneath them so their upper body can keep going down, but most yoga studio owners won't allow us to dig pits in the room. So by propping ourselves up in these platforms, there's no limit to how low you can go. Sandbags can also be used here to help stabilize and add a little bit more juice to the poses. Legs at the top of the thighs, again, rooting in the tops of the thighs. And this allows you to be muscularly relaxed. And then once more, you can add a little bit more flexion stress by placing the sandbags along the spine. For people who can't fold forward too far, again, flexion of the neck may be a problem. They can rest their head onto the bolster, either on the end of the bolster. You just feel supported here. Whereas Dana has shown in half butterfly, you can still do the same things with propping yourself up with multiple bolsters. Remember, in yin yoga, we want to stay here for a long period of time, and this is a very yin-like pose. So you make yourself comfortable enough that you can marinate here for five or even ten minutes. Now that doesn't mean that you don't feel anything, you still want to feel some sensation. But you want to be comfortable enough that you can stay with those sensations. together in butterfly, then we did half butterfly, straddle pull, and that was simply draw the legs together in the caterpillar. As we come into caterpillar, we're changing the dynamics a bit. No longer are the adductor muscles involved in this pose, but it's pure hamstrings. So once again, as we come forward, it's advisable to sit up on a cushion to help tilt the hips. For some people, again, they may need multiple cushions to get a little bit higher to come forward. On the other hand, if it's the hamstrings that are tight that prevent you from coming forward, bending the knees, bring a bolster underneath the knees. This releases the hamstrings, allows you to come forward enough so now again gravity can draw you down. Now, if you're one of the poor people who are cursed by being flexible, you don't need bolsters, you just flop down on your legs. You might need to get out of your own way by moving the legs just slightly apart. Now you can come forward. But again, here, you might want a bit extra juice by having some sort of sandbag on here. By the way, there's different weights of sandbags. You can get five pounds, 10 pounds. This is a 50 pound bag we're putting on the right now. So it's pretty juicy here. Just release that. <laughs> Other props? That's only 15 pounds. 50. <laughs> Six kilos. For some students, coming forward is, is difficult, so they're even up on blocks, it's challenging to allow gravity to draw them forward. So you could suggest that they use a strap, having it around the feet, but remind them that it's not about engaging muscles, it's a practice that is about softening and releasing the muscles. So the strap is simply there to give them some help to move in the right direction. 
as opposed to an active yang-like engagement of lengthening of the muscles, still softening as they come forward. And this is the case where the straps are extending our reach. Some people, when they come forward to a degree, they kind of stop because they can't flex their spine or their pelvis any further, but they're kind of hanging in space. So again, using bolsters or something else to relax the upper body onto means that the back muscles can release. When the back muscles release, more of the stress is going to go into the ligaments along the spine. And there's 11 layers of ligaments wrapping the spine here. In yin yoga, that's what we're trying to target. These are the tissues we're trying to energize. So being able to relax in the forward fold is quite important. And you can use a combination of blocks and bolsters depending on where you are and where you need the support to be. Now we've been working the legs a fair bit with the seated poses, the butterfly, half butterfly, straddle, and caterpillar. We come up a little bit higher now, we start to work on the hips. And quite a juicy one for the hips is shoelace, where you bring one knee on top of the other. Often you lift up to snuggle down, and then you sit back down again. First thing to check always is any pain in the knees. If the bottom knee doesn't like this, straighten the bottom leg. If the top knee doesn't like it, you can put some support between the legs. Now some people find the shoelace better if you sit on the floor. It just provides a bit more juice into the hips. But for many people, especially beginners or those with very tight hips, they need to sit up on something. Otherwise this pose just isn't going to work for them. The cushion you can use here is nice to just rotate it 45 degrees. Now you have a line for each leg. You just put this underneath you, and now this pose is a piece of cake. You can stay here for half an hour, you can watch TV, no problem to it. If there is some problems to it, we've got some props to help you. So if you're not coming forward very far, it's again nice to have support so your body can relax. So you can bring a bolster in and that might also be able to support your head so you can relax your neck. If you're not able to come that far forward, you could use the bolster for forehead support. If you're coming further down, you could use the bolster for your arms or perhaps just your forehead. If you don't have a bolster, a block could serve a similar function. You have the high setting of the block, resting your elbows onto the block, head into your hands. And then as you open up, just switch the height setting. Eventually you come lower and lower. Until eventually you're all the way down. If you've got sandbags to work with, again, rooting the top of the thigh can be a nice, po a nice way to uh, find a bit of uh, weight into the top of the thighs and then come forward. Or if you're further down and you've got someone to help, they can put the sandbag on your back. So again, the weight of the sandbag just helps make the flexion a little bit juicier. And you just marinate here for five or 10 minutes. Or one minute. For the students that are much more externally rotated, and I'm not, so I really can't show you this one too much. You start to bring the feet further forward. As you do that, the sensation in the knees might increase, and that's not a good sign. This is meant to work the hips. But for some people, the feet might start to slip here. Again, you can use the sandbags to just restrain movement, just to help keep the feet in that position, especially as you start to come forward. Even on top of the feet can feel nice. Some people, just sitting up tall is enough. There's enough work into the hips and they just stay here. Now we have options of doing other things with the upper body. You can do upper body yin as well. You can do a side bend. You're walking your hand out to the side, maybe something with the back hand behind your, or the hand behind your back. Now again, you're kind of hanging in space here, so the muscles are engaging. But if you can rest your elbow onto a block, now you can relax. Depending how flexible you are, you can switch the height setting of the blocks, going lower and lower. So maybe after a two or three minutes, you might get to the point where the elbow's on the floor. But you don't have to get there all at once. Some people in the young world know this as the cow face. In the cow face, we do the traditional hand behind your back. But for some people who can't clasp their hand behind the back, this is where the straps can make it accessible. And then it has the option 
Maybe they're using their hair, the ponytail. But in my case, I don't use my hair, so just having a strap here, again, creates the length, the extended reach, to allow you to feel something into the shoulders. We've been looking at a number of poses that work the hips. We looked at the butterfly, we looked at the shoelace. In that same family, the only difference between butterfly and shoelace was the amount of adduction or abduction of the, the legs. With the butterfly, the legs are adducted apart. With shoelace, they're adducted apart. In between, there's a pose called square. But then we'll show you the square pose. And just like we saw for the shoelace and for butterfly, one of the key props to use here is a cushion. Something to help you sit up. Because for some people, they want to add the flexion coming forward. And that's going to be made easier if you're sitting up on something. So we have to be careful with the knees when you're working with the hips. So even if you're not feeling your knees, you may want to support them just so that the body feels safe and can relax. So you can use blocks under the knees, you can use blankets, you can use whatever you have to hand to support your knees so that they're feeling safe. If you have bolsters, those can work as well. So the knees are supported and it won't affect the work you're doing in your hips coming forward. If you're not able to come forward very far, you might want to support your forehead or you use a bolster for your arms. If you're further down, you could use a bolster on your thighs or down in front of you to go further and be supported. As Diana has mentioned in the other poses, as you come forward, if you're not feeling this very much in the back, you can add a little bit extra weight with the sandbag, just to make it a little bit juicier. Now you hang out here. If you're quite open in your hips, you may want to experiment transitioning from a, this square with both feet on the floor to a deeper variation of square. It's on its way to double pigeon, but it's resting the outer foot, the outer shin up on top of a bolster. So it's lifted, changes things in the hips, maybe more intense. So another way to target the hips is a nice pose called the swan. You can come from the shoelace into swan simply by taking the top leg and stretching it all the way back. Now, swan is a hip opener. There is a danger it can go into the front knee. So you might find people leaning to the side here because they're protecting the knee. Another option is to bring that heel in and then center yourself. Or have some support underneath that front hip. Here, there's lots of things you can use, a cushion. For some people, that hip's going to be very high off the ground, so you might need a block, something higher, or a number of blankets folded in. Or even a bolster that's across the mat for students whose hips are quite high, they might enjoy having the support of a bolster so that they're not sinking too far down. You still want to feel something, and this targets the hip from the top of the back thigh. But again, if you can't get that sensation, then use the bolster. Now there's two types of the swan. There's the proud swan, where you're sitting up nice and tall. And then there's the sleeping swan, where you slowly come down, resting your chest towards the floor. For some people, that's a little bit too much going that far down. So you can use the bolster, as Diana is showing, to give you a, a way station along the way that you can just stop at and really rest here. You can vary the height of the bolster. You can add a second bolster so that you're finding the right place and working with your own body and not using the props to dictate that. Another option for a swan if you have access to stairs is to use the stairs to go a little bit deeper. As long as it's feeling safe for your knee, no sensation in the knee, you can rest your front leg at the top of the stair and then drape the back leg behind. And depending on the length of the back leg femur, you might even be able to rest your back knee on a step below and you can add support uh, blankets if you need to and recline if that feels comfortable. You have sandbags, you've got someone to help, they can put the sandbag on your back if you're low enough to either be supported on a bolster or a block or on the floor. Here the sandbag can be along the sacrum, 
to really root down here again the target area is the hips and this is going to provide a little bit more juice in the hips. Now if you really want to get to the hips one of the beautiful ways is to go visit the land of the dragons. The dragon is basically a low lunge. A number of people might find this one not too available for a number of different reasons. There's one proportion problem that some people have and that's simply the length of the shin is longer than the length of their arms. So when they try to come down, they can't get their hands flat to the floor. By using blocks and need either one or both hands, you can allow yourself to really relax here. Now some weight being carried into my arms, I can soften the hips and get deeper into this pose. And I exactly will make this available for different lengths of arms, if you will. A lot of people in the dragon, though, feel blocked here at the top of the hip. If you feel the top of the pelvis, this is technically known as your ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine. And as you flex the pelvis, sometimes that starts to contact the top of the thigh. And you get a painful pinching in here anytime you come into a lunge, anytime you bring your knees to your chest, a panahasana, or even in child's pose. So one option, as Dan is showing, is to try and create some space here by using a belt. You can fold it over a few times, tuck that in there, and as you come forward, it just prevents that painful compression from happening, which means you can stay here longer. If you don't have a belt, you could also use a scarf, a blanket, anything you have to hand that you can wedge into the top of the thigh right at the hip to bring space. As we progress through the dragon cycle, we might start here in the kind of the baby dragon. Then you might come into the low flying dragon. You start to walk your hands out. And at some point, you're stopped. But notice how you're carrying weight in the arms. The muscles are relaxed. Sorry, the muscles are engaged here. So by using blocks, you might be able to rest your elbows onto the blocks. So now you can relax here. Eventually, over time, you'll get your elbows to the floor. But if you can't quite get there, use the blocks. Where Dan is showing, you can use the bolster. Another problem that can often arise in the dragon is uncomfortable pressure on the back knee. And this can happen in swan and many other lunges as well. Especially for people that aren't so far forward with that back knee, a lot of pressure comes right under the knee. We would encourage the students to walk the front foot forward and really try to lean into it, but even that may not be sufficient. So some options. One is to have a cushion underneath the shin itself. Now the cushion is underneath the shin and not the knee. And this means that the knee is not feeling any compression. There's no pressure directly on the knee. If that's not working, another option is simply have a blanket and have the knee resting on the blanket as well. Just a bit of support here. Because the dragons are such beautiful poses, you're going to want to play with them for a long time. So make sure the back knee is not complaining. If you've got sandbags where you're practicing, you could use a sandbag in your high flying dragon to weigh down the top of the thigh of the front leg. Just make sure that the intensity you're feeling is appropriate and you're not going too deep into the pose or holding too long. Now we're going to focus more on the spine. We saw a bit of the spine in some of the other seated poses when we were doing forward flexion. Now we're going the other direction into extension. Starting with the Sphinx pose. When you come into Sphinx, you basically come onto your stomach, and it might be nice to clasp your elbows first, just to position the elbows shoulder width apart, and then just let this marinate. This is a beautiful pose all by itself, but for some people, the sensation in the lower back starts to diminish rather quickly. So we can use a prop or a bolster to help lift the chest a bit higher. You put a bolster underneath the, the elbows. You can allow yourself to come up even further. And you can add multiple props here, you can have blocks or other things just to keep you coming up higher and higher so that you continue to find an edge. So you could raise your bolster on top of blocks to get higher as well, if you don't have two bolsters around. And for some people, they're not looking at how to go deeper, they're trying to figure out how can I stay here even just on my Forms. So as Dan is showing, having the bolster underneath the armpits allows the upper body to really relax here. 
It's nice if your shoulders are carrying tension because you're no longer holding yourself up on your arms and your shoulders are not engaging so you can soften there. If you need support for your head, you could use your hands or you could use blocks if you have them. Various blocks at different heights so that you're in the right place where your forehead can rest comfortably. If you are using a bolster under the top of the chest, make sure it's not so low that it is actually taking you out of the curve in the lumbar and lessening the pose, unless that's your intention. And if you have sandbags around and someone to help, a sandbag on the lower back can feel very nice to help root in the pelvis. Again, the intention is to increase sensation by using the handbags. The intention is to increase sensation when using the sandbags. If you have a particularly heavy handbag, you can use that. <laughs> and if the floor is too firm under your pelvis, then layer your mat, fold your mat, add blankets under your pelvis so that you're comfortable. For some students who have stomach issues, and it's not a good idea to press the belly into the floor, you want to make sure you use the options where you're resting your hips onto a bolster. So bolsters can become quite useful in this pose. Simply place the bolster towards the middle of your mat, then perhaps bring another cushion up towards the front of your mat, and allow your hips to be on the bolster while you rest your arms on to the other bolster. In this way, the belly can hang down to the floor without any compression. And this is lovely for pregnant women or for people, as I mentioned, who have stomach disorders. A beautiful way to work the spine in a different orientation instead of flexion or extension is to come in the side extension. This is known as the banana, banana asana. And the animal show this lying to the side here. Now, most of the world, bananas are allowed to be curved. Some bananas are straight. Again, the intention is just to get to a place where you feel some stress. But for some people, the legs keep sliding out. So if, if you need to, you can put a sandbag here to provide some support. Now the legs won't slide out to the side. You can work the upper body more completely. Other people often will find in bananasana, they start to lift the hip up. Maybe they're not quite clear on what the pose is meant to do, but you really want to weight that hip down so you can put a sandbag onto the, the pelvis here. And to help that sandbag not slide off, if you prop it with a block, it'll help stay on your hip. And a sandbag on this outer shoulder can also feel nice. Again, you may want to prop it on a block. And you understand why we call Diana the bag lady? She loves sandbagging herself. Yeah, that feels nice. You could even do more than one sandbag, one on top of the other at the hip, as long as it's feeling comfortable, just that extra weight can bring you into more sensation. You can see it's a little hard to do all this bagging by yourself, so it's important to have a good friend around, some partner. You can train your dog to carry the bags and put them in place for you. the banana. It has a lot of appeal. <laughs> One of the juiciest poses in the Yin Yoga lexicon is a pose known as the saddle. Now there's a number of different ways to get into it. We we'll talk about that in the other videos. But it depends on your range of motion. The first thing you want to check in saddle is to see if this pose is available. And that means you've got to check how your ankles feel and how your kneecaps feel. This can be a wonderful stress for both these areas, but if it's too much, some options are to sit up on something, perhaps stacking a block on top of a cushion and have them between your feet. Now there's less pressure on the ankles. If you're a little bit higher up, there's less stress on the kneecaps. You can also help bring a bit of space into the knee by using a bit of strap at the back of each knee. So if you have the luxury of having two straps, just fold a few layers, but keep it balanced so you've got the same amount of thickness at the back of each knee. 
behind the knee and then folding back. It's bringing a bit of space into the knee. Try not to use one strap across both because then your knees will be locked together and you want to give the body the freedom to move where it needs to go and not stress or risk harm into the body. If it's the ankles that are complaining, you can put a blanket underneath here. Or if you don't have a blanket, some toweling or even rolled up socks. Something underneath the ankles to just provide a bit of support. Because a lot of people can't make their ankles go completely flat, 180 degrees. The other thing you can do is, is to support the toes as well as lifting the ankle. So if you have a blanket, have a bit of the blanket that's a bit higher, so the toes are lower down than the ankle. And that will give some relief there. That can also apply in any of the low lunges with the back foot, although there's not as much pressure saying the dragon of the swan as there is here in the saddle. So now that you've decided what to do about your feet and positioning, it's time to start going backwards. Now, a lot of people just come to laying on their hands, and this is good enough. If you're feeling the stress here, you hang out here. But if you can go a bit further, you can get almost to your elbows. Then you're at the state where you might want to have some support. So in my case, I'm just coming to the elbows here. I'm not quite on the ground, so again, the muscles are working here to help support me. I have to keep the head up as well. But as Dan will show, if you put a bolster lengthwise along the spine, and you start to recline, now you can relax here. Now Diane has used both a block and a bolster as an incline to help her come up. You could also put two bolsters on top of each other, then as you open up, maybe go to one bolster. And if you're not able to get as low as one bolster or two bolsters, you could lean your bolster against the wall and just come back very slightly, but have the support of the wall behind your bolster. You might be able to come lower down, and you can always change your props as you hold the pose over time. In this case, you can see how Diana's head is now resting on the bolster as well. For some people, they might have a block under their head, they might need just a little bit more extra support here. Making sure it's not too much. In this case, she's used a blanket, which is nice because sometimes a block here would be a bit too much and the head is too flexed. So here she can really relax and be comfortable. Another deeper version of this is to have the arm over your head. But for some people, if that feels like their arms are kind of just hanging in space, you can support the arms as well, especially if you get any tingling feeling in the fingers. You might want to lift the arms up a little bit further. Tingling is usually a sign that the nerve that innervates the arm, called the brachial plexus, is being compressed by the clavicle. So by bringing the arms up a bit, you avoid that compression of the nerve. You can also use bolsters if you have plenty of bolsters under your arms, especially if that's not um, comfortable for your shoulders to have your arms coming down to the floor. So supporting your arms on piles of blankets or bolsters as well can help. For some people in the saddle, the knees come up and often will ask, where should my knees be? Well, it's not a question of where your knees should be, it's where your knees go to. The body will go to the place where it needs to go. But if you want, with the knees up in the air, you can add a little bit of support, again, with a bolster, blankets. In this case, I'm using a rolled up yoga mat. And again, that allows the muscles to release, so you're not just hanging in space. If your knees are on the floor, and you've got a sandbag, it would be nice to weigh down uh, the front of the thighs for the sandbag. And it can also feel nice on the belly, so you can play with where you place the sandbag. If you want a deeper back bend, you could sit up on height simply in order to give more of a focus in the spine when you come back. So you're up on height, so when you come down, you're going into the back bend. You can see how much more an arch Dan is now created by having the bolster underneath the sacrum. Now we're going to look at different variations for the reclining twist. And then we'll show you here, you come and lie down. There are different ways of doing the reclining twist. You can have one knee bent, you can have both knees bent. Here she's showing the one knee bent option. And often for a lot of people that front knee, the top knee is floating. And that can be okay, but the bones feel like they're hanging in space, the muscles can't really relax. So by putting a bolster or a block or some support underneath that leg, 
the body can release and relax. For some people, it's the shoulder that floats. So if the opposite shoulder is floating, you can put a blanket or some support here. So again, the intention is to allow the student to just hang out here and there's no muscular engagement. So if your hand is floating when you've got a blanket under your shoulder, you may want to use support, a block or bolster to support your hand or the wrist. Now this also applies if you're doing a two-knee version. For some people who are a little bit stiffer, they need to bend both knees, but there's also the knees are off the ground, so using a bolster there can help them just relax into the pose. Bolster either under the bottom leg or if it's the top leg that floats, you could put the bolster between the knees so that the top leg is supported. Well, often what will happen here though too is well for people that are a little bit tighter, they can't quite come into the pose because they're falling away from it. And so if you put a bolster or some support along the spine here, now they can stay into the pose and they're not rolling out and falling into it. And another option to try for a student whose hips are rolling out of the pose as opposed to taking them deeper is to take the top leg and extend it out so there's a bit more weight further away it might bring them into the pose more and you could use a bolster the whole length of the lower leg and foot to help and if you have sandbags which we do it can be nice to have a sandbag on the hip top of the thigh perhaps on the shoulder, as long as it doesn't trigger any tingling in the fingers. Again, you can prop up the sign by Again, the intention in yin yoga is to feel a stress. The stress comes from gravity, but in this case, gravity is being assisted here with the use of the weight of the sign by. See that the props can be used to help us increase the intensity of a pose or to decrease the intensity of the pose, depending on where you're at in the pose. Props can help to make a pose more accessible. They can also help you to marinate in the pose longer by making them more comfortable. Props can also help to lengthen the body, as Dan showed one time with the straps, just lengthening the length of your arms, or to open the body to use the props to help to separate the tissues from each other. But again, there's no limit to the creativity you can employ with props. Just remember the intention is to come to a sensation, come to your edge, become still, and hold for time. If the props help you get the sensation, if the props help you to become still, if the props help you to stay longer, then they're great props. Use whatever you can use, whatever you can find. So I hope this will help you in your yin journey. Namaste. Namaste.